This is True North TV, powered by Communitech, from Waterloo Region in Ontario, Canada, to the world. The conversations you need and want to hear with interesting people on topics at the intersection of technology and humanity. Tech for good. Let's get started. Well, thank you, Talia. That was wonderful. And welcome, everyone, to True North TV. Today, we have a very special guest. It's Laura May Lindo. Welcome. It's great to have you on Tree North TV. We're thrilled that you could join us. It's, it's been a remarkable few weeks since George Floyd was killed by police in Minneapolis. Millions of people around the world have mobilized to protest anti-Black racism and demand change. Two weeks ago, today, you addressed a crowd of thousands in downtown Kitchener at the KW Solidarity March for Black Lives Matter. What have these past few weeks been like for you as a Black Canadian from Waterloo Region, as a, an academic, and as an elected representative? The last few weeks have been hard, to be honest. Um, I think uh, part of what has been the most difficult is that um, as an elected official, you are often asked to speak about um, large events, like large-scale events like this. Um, and it's a challenge to do so when you are also impacted um, personally uh, by the kinds of conversations that you're having. So one of the things uh, that actually happened during the Solidarity March, I couldn't stop crying. Um, just, I was overwhelmed by the support from um, folks from all over Kitchener Centre. I had not ever seen um, a rally of that size in downtown Kitchener. Uh, the fact that they were coming out during a pandemic, fully masked, um, you know, helping each other, supporting each other, uh, it was overwhelming. And so um, I'm finding that trying to create space for myself uh, to sort of separate out uh, my role as a leader in the community and um, my just humanity, my personhood, um, and having to sort of take a bit of time just to be present. And still. It's so important for us to be present during these uh, types of events and I, I not that we've lived through very many of them and, and certainly in my lifetime. Um, racism and policing is being uh, the primary focus of these protests and many people are calling to defund the police and redirect money to things like improved social services. Do, do we have an opportunity here to radically innovate the way we respond to emergencies in our society? I mean, has traditional policing as we know it sort of had its day? That's an amazing question. Um, I think that it's interesting because this is something else. It's a consequence of everything that's been happening. Um, it's like I want to answer you personally, and then I want to answer you as the MPP for Kitchener Center. Um, and so I'm going to start with the personal and on the personal side, black communities and indigenous communities have been talking about the problems in policing uh, since, in my opinion, the beginning of time. And part of that goes back to uh, the roots of policing itself. Um, and as much as we speak about innovations that have happened within policing and um, the, the sort of expanded role that we hope uh, police can play in our communities. Um, for Black and Indigenous folks, the role of policing was very specific. It was literally to police our bodies, um, to ensure that we were in the right place that society decided and determined that we were supposed to be in. And so as a consequence, the relationship is rooted in something that does not necessarily build the trust that we would need to be able to sort of make a couple switches of the, of the system to be able to address. So then when I jump over and I take off my personal hat and put on my MPP hat, what I am hearing from community, and my office is inundated with um, letters from community members um, that were at the Solidarity Rally and have taken the time to think about um, the calls to action that were coming in from community. 
and they have asked for a redistribution of funding. They have asked for fundamental change in um, the value system that we have in society. Um, and I tend to think that the reason that these calls are coming in this way is because we are also having all of these discussions in the midst of a pandemic, which in a weird way has opened up an opportunity for us um, to rethink what we invest in, what society looks like. Like we keep talking about what is the post COVID world going to look like. Um, that also means what does it look like for racialized folks? What would happen if we created a world where um, we centered um, preventative programs and preventative solutions, um, which would just naturally decrease interactions between racialized folks and the police um, or poor folks and the police, any marginalized group and the police. Um, so I tend to think uh, it is a very odd opportunity in the midst of chaos. Um, and when you've got the entire population or the majority of the population saying it's time for us to revisit this, my job literally as a member of provincial parliament is to take that seriously and start to get to work. It's interesting this idea of, you know, is it time to rethink policing or traditional policing? Um, of course, there's a, there's a city in New Jersey, Camden, New Jersey, which, uh, which defunded the police, I believe it was seven years ago, and they've had just a remarkable experience from it. Um, and I believe crime has dropped to a fraction of what it was, um, a violent crime. And, um, and, and, and so it's, it's interesting. It's, I, I wonder, you know, a good friend of mine, his mother's very, you know, she's, she's very old. And, and they, 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 like many people in Canada, they came to Canada with 43 cents in their pocket. And, um, and, and they were running away from, from a very bad place. And, but she said, you know, I wonder if all these things that are happening to us right now, they've, they've, they've been sent to us to force us to examine some of the fundamentals of our society, to put us back on the right track to get us to pay attention to things like racism and, and the, the possibility of completely reinventing things like policing, not, you know, not to, to forget all the other sort of aspects of our society that really do require an examination. And, and, and so maybe, this, maybe these things were sent to us to force us to, to, to move on some of these issues. It's, have you thought about all about that? You know what? It's funny. I have. Um, when we were at the Solidarity Rally, uh, a number of Indigenous community members that I've worked with that I consider to be good friends of mine um, were also there. And I remember one person saying to me, it's as though Mother Earth is resetting. Right? And I am a very spiritual person as well. And I tend to think these things don't happen um, without some kind of bigger purpose or, or a deeper reason. Um, and nothing is going to happen without us uh, being able to create some form of an opportunity to do better um, in the midst of it. And so for me, um, I, I think that this has given us a space to reflect on, um, on our values, to reflect on how we can do things better and my hope, though, is that we will continue to center care and compassion for communities as we have this discussion. It's interesting, too, because um, as we, I know we are talking and we're thinking about the calls to defund the police, um, but the police are like a sliver in a huge system that has been hurting Black and Indigenous people for a very long time. And sometimes by only focusing on one place where there is the most tension, you lose an opportunity to think bigger, right? And it's not, it's not just the police. It's, it's the criminal justice system. It's the fact that we don't have enough mental health services. Um, when people are looking at uh, the kinds of calls that police are getting right now, many of those calls are mental health calls. Why would we want armed people to show up at a mental health call? Um, and which police officer decided to become a police officer in order to do mental health work? 
like people that wanted to do mental health work would have chosen a different profession. Um, and it's not to say one is better or worse than the other. It's that there is a reason that they are, there's a different skill set for those things. There's a different need. Um, and when I think, when I reflect back on um, some of the, the most horrendous uh, examples of the, the interaction of police and uh, a mental health call, it's often the, the dialogue from the police side is, I had to act fast. I had to, because that's what you have to do if you were addressing a violent uh, situation. Um, but when you're dealing with mental health, you actually have to try and slow down and calm down because the more you escalate is the more they escalate. And so we're literally asking the wrong system to, <laughs> to go in and try and help um, somebody in need. And I think that we can do better. Um, and I think that everybody would be happier if we could. That's really interesting, Laurie May. Th thank you for sharing that with us. I, I, it's interesting. We started, we kicked off um, True North TV with, John C. D. Brown, who's you know one of the sort of elder states person of uh, Silicon Valley, and um, and and he ran an organization called Park, and they you know invented things like the personal computer and and the mouse and all kinds of other things that are so important or every day in our lives now. And um, and the interesting thing about him is that he has always been the person who thinks about people, and it's the you know, at the time when, you know, technology was romanticized and um, uh, everyone was focused on the technology, he was the one who said, you know, human beings actually have to use this. And the interesting thing right now and the words that he's using, um, and he's doing actually doing uh, um, a lot of work with uh, Indigenous people in, in Northern Canada, is he talks about, you know, listening to the earth and, and living in this world. Um, and the importance of being present. Um, so it's, in, it's interesting how many of the threads that we're looking at as we go through this COVID period um, start to tie together. Um, hearing these voices from, you know, San Jose and from, you know, Kitchener-Waterloo. But, but speaking of policing, before we move off the policing topic, of course, I'm going to be interviewing Chief Larkin in the next few days. And I'm curious, what, what do you think I should ask them? That's another good question. Um, I think one of the big questions that um, I'm hearing actually from community uh, for Chief Larkin is, um, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. So look, I'm messing it up already, but it's more of a comment. What I'm hearing on the ground is this. There have been a lot of news stories that have, um, that have reported that uh, Chief Larkin and a lot of other uh, uh, elected officials are ready and willing to have a conversation with Black communities, and I would add Indigenous communities in there. I'm sure that they're willing to have this, have a real talk with uh, communities most impacted by the conversations that we're having now around defunding the police. Um, the issue has been nobody has actually reached out to the communities uh, to talk to them, and so. Um, Without sounding uh, a little too forward, I would like to actually set a date for communities to sit down and talk. Because at the end of the day, if everything is mediated through the media, there will be no change. Um, and so we, uh, it, we have to do more than words. We have to do more than speaking. And we have to do more than desiring um, to, to have a better world. We have to actually actively create it. And so um, I just want to sort of take a pause in the difficult nature of the conversation and make a request that we do come together and have this conversation. And I truly believe that if we have um, all of us in a room to talk, there will have to be... Um, like that action alone will bring a different level of change. And so that would be what I would want to share with Chief Larkin. You know, that's, that's powerful. You know, it's, um, it's, it's interesting because of course we, uh, we are known as being a, a very innovative community and, 
in many respects, uh, you know, Canada looks to us to help figure out what uh, what's next and 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 where we need to focus. Um, maybe this is an opportunity for us to apply that you know that that sort of very strong innovation ability to engineer solutions to any problems uh, and start applying those in in a social context. So maybe maybe this is a big opportunity. I'm certainly going to ask them about that and and uh, and and uh, see if we we. Uh, we could have some dialogue around that. Um, you know, it's it's it, it's interesting because we live in this great place called Waterloo Region, Ontario, and Canada, and and often we feel removed from the kinds of problems that we see in the U.S. and other places, or or maybe not. Um, and uh, we, I want to, I want to talk, I want you to talk a bit about that. But is the, the other piece in that because because you know I think yeah. You know, the, the other piece in that is, is there a way to sort of pierce the bubble that we live in um, so that people have a much stronger understanding or better understanding as to the challenges that people face, not just in the U.S. and other places, but here within Canada? It's, it's funny because um, as you were asking that, this is, this is a refrain that I keep hearing right now. So there's one segment of society that's like, wow, this is new information. And then there's a whole other group of us that are like, wow, welcome to my world. (laughs) And so um, in terms of piercing the bubble, I actually think that the bubble has been pierced. Um, What even when I uh, compare the solidarity rallies that are happening now with the solidarity rallies uh, that were happening with BLM Toronto um, in 2017, for instance, when they uh, did up Tent City in front of the police station. There's a different vibe and a different understanding and a different call to action. So at that point in time, we were again having this conversation, oh, this is new, I thought this was only in the States, etc. cetera. Um, and BLM was like, nah. This has been happening here. And that's why the calling of the names is so important. Um, Even at the Solidarity Rally in Kitchener um, two weeks ago, we did libations for the folks that have died um, here, right, in interactions with the police. And so um, for many of us, this isn't new. But what is new? Because I am an eternal optimist, Ian. No one can take that from me. No one. Um, what is new is the number of um, thought leaders in Kitchener uh, and Waterloo and across the region who are willing to have a conversation about it. Like, I actually think it's particularly special that, um, you know, I would get a phone call from Communitech saying, hey, why don't you come and have a conversation about racism? Like, that's not, that's not a typical phone call for me, Right. Um, And so I think that that's really important. And it comes on the heels of other kinds of conversations coming to my office. So I'm going to, as my people say, stick a pin in that to say this. Um, When I'm at, uh, when I'm at Queens Park, uh, and we're having conversations around race and racism, that's sort of one interaction where politics starts to talk about what my lived experience is. But what a lot of people don't realize is that when I'm sitting in my office uh, in Market Square, I have a lot of racialized folks that are right here in Kitchener who have seen some of the debates that are happening at Queens Park and they come in to talk to me about what's happening right here in town. Um, And one of the big conversations that has been happening, I've been having uh, black women who have, They've all of their studies and all of their experiences in the tech sector, and here they are now, and they're trying to find a way to get into the tech sector. And so I'm able to um, talk to them sort of on, in a different way. I'm able to talk to them and potentially introduce them to people that I've met like you, all of that kind of stuff. But now that conversation um, about the realities of being a racialized person trying to navigate systems that were never really open to you is taking on um, like a, a deeper meaning where more people are willing to do the work to create a space so that next time they call, I can say, actually, listen, I was taught, you know, I was on this show 
And we were talking about this and people want real change. And I think that is the piece um, that is keeping me hopeful, making me realize how much has changed and would make me argue that the bubble has burst. And now it's time for us to actually do that rebuilding. And being in somewhere like Waterloo Region, as you were saying, where there's such um, a depth of, of innovation and a desire to innovate and a desire to collaborate in that innovation, this makes me think that there's a possibility to do things differently here. Um, and so for that reason, I feel blessed to be going through such a difficult time in this particular space. Um, I'm going to go back and re-ask the question. You don't have to re-answer it, but I, I, I think I, I think I want to ask the question differently now. Listening to your your your, your answer, um, Laura May, there's you know we were blessed to live in this great community, this great country, and there's um, you know there's a lot of people um, who feel very far removed from the kinds of problems that we see in the U.S. and other places, but you know, are they really far removed? And what has been your experience? The other aspect of my question is, you know, what is it we could do to actually pierce this bubble to contribute to lasting and meaningful change? And then the third piece is, what do you see as having changed? Am I allowed to answer it? Oh, you <laughs> now that you asked it again, now I'm like, wait, I got more. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm good. So good, so good. Um, you know, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I, I too am an optimist, optimist and, and look at these as being uh, opportunities for us to affect significant change in all aspects of, uh, of our world. Um, the other piece that I wanted to talk to you a bit about is, um, is, is about this notion of um, how do we as a, as a tech community do more? Uh, you know, True North, of course, is all about tech for good. We know we have, uh, dealing with issues of racism and, and subconscious bias, are chronic problems in the tech industry. Um, and, you know, there is a challenge for racialized people to use technology because it's being built by you know, what young white men in, in, in Silicon Valley. But how do we make society more equitable? How do we address and, you know, sort of for your last answer, you know, how do we bring everyone along and get them to realize that they have to be part of the solution? This is not about making a pledge on Twitter saying that you're not going to be a racist because, the, you know, that isn't going to change anything. What we really have to do, in my humble opinion, is we have to commit to looking inward at our own biases, the way that we operate, the way that we operate as, a, as an individual and as an organization, and looking outward as to the programs that we run and can they do more to be more inclusive. Things like our Fierce Founders program is a fantastic platform to promote female founders, and we called it Fierce Founders, and, and actually the the, um, the logo for Fierce Founders originally had boxing gloves in it and a shattered glass ceiling. But, you know, now we're looking at this and saying, you know, this is a platform that we could do much more with. So what, what, where, where's, your sort of, where's your head in sort of all of this um, as we think about how we bring everyone along and make people part of the solution? Um. That is also a very good question. My brain is in like 5,000 places at once. Um, so part of the, the challenge for me is that I bring together uh, some research that I've done in the past, along with uh, sort of my, my lived experience of um, sort of navigating workplaces and employment, that kind of stuff. So sometimes my responses end up being long-winded, but here it is. Here it comes. Are you ready? Are you taping? No, I'm just teasing. Um, so there is a history of um, fighting for equity, fighting for everybody. And then once only some people have received um, sort of their shot to, to take part in this, whatever it is that you're fighting for, we stop the fight. 
And so when you were talking to me about Fierce Founders, um, what actually uh, came to mind is this history of feminism, right? So in the history of feminism, there are a lot of fights that um, black, brown, indigenous women uh, fought alongside white women to, you know, get the vote, to make sure that, you know, we had access to, um, to education, access to employment and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but in the many of those historical periods in time, first, because of the way that race politics plays out in the world, um, first white women would get access and then we would kind of stop fighting. Like we would assume that everything was okay. And then for, in a lot of spaces, uh, the white women that had now gained access to these sort of positions of influence and privilege would say, okay, just wait. Like we've already done one big change. We just have to be more patient. And that's when you would start to lose other racialized women getting into these spaces, black women not getting into the spaces, indigenous women not getting into the spaces. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating about this moment in history is that there is a huge cry of solidarity. So you are seeing Indigenous um, folks with Black folks fighting together, recognizing that these systems have harmed us both. And we pool our histories and all of a sudden we realize, wait a second, this is what has happened. That we start to fight, some people make it through, and then we stop. I tell you that to tell you this. I think that we have to be committed to um, actually listening and reflecting back when we are doing some of these programs um, to make sure that everybody actually got there. Sometimes because the conversations are so difficult, we sort of stop listening, right? We get some new different people sitting around a table. We're like, okay, job here is done. And then we stop listening to the people on the ground who are saying, no, 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 but what about um, what about these folks? What about this issue? What about that? So that's one, one big thought that I had. Um, I also think that uh, there's ways for us to recognize that it's insufficient to just look internally and decide that you as an individual um, are a good person because it's not act the systems that are oppressing black and indigenous folks aren't actually they're, they are propped up by individuals, but they're not individuals these days that are just sort of saying, yeah, I don't want that black person to get here. It happens. But truly, this, the systems that are hurting us the most are the ones that we have all consented to and that we all just assume are okay. And then we don't listen to each other to, to find out that they're actually not. And so I have sort of been veering away from the the personal reflection piece and more towards the action piece. And the action piece for me is the, the investment upstream. It's making sure that everybody is healthy, making sure that everybody can eat, making sure that everybody has access to affordable housing, making sure that everybody has access to technology because now in, in my opinion, um, in the 21st century, access to technology is as important as access to food because we are putting everything online, not just because of COVID, but prior to this, we were seeing that movement. Um, I would argue that uh, our tech sector here, at least in Waterloo region, um, was one of the first to step up to try and help with some of that without actually reflecting, in my opinion, I, I'm on the outside of it, without necessarily reflecting on the benefit to tech, but more because they were able to help, which on, in, my, in my humble opinion is massive. That is hugely important. And my, my example of that is in education. When everything shut down during COVID and portals were starting and kids couldn't get online, um, I was hearing that the tech sector was coming together to try and get computers to, to households. Um, that the tech sector, our thought leaders here, were trying to make sure that people had access. Um, I don't, I think that we, sometimes these moments in history, again, because they're so heavy, we spend so much time thinking about all of the horrible things that we forget to pay attention to what did work and then amplify that. And so my focus, at, again, as an eternal optimist, is to look at what was working and what is working and amplify that. Um, I don't think people realized how many kids didn't have access to a computer at home or didn't have access to the internet at home 
or couldn't had like low uh, low internet access because they couldn't afford a higher um, you know a package. And so now when you throw everything online, that's something that we have to think about when we think about equity. Um, and I think that we all have a part to play in that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how, um, you know, I think I was just up um, at a cottage and I felt like I was back in 1997 again with, you know, taking five minutes to download the web page. But it's true. Your point is, is absolutely bang on because, you know, I think that, I think internet is now, you know, essential infrastructure in our country um, that we cannot compete. We can't learn. We can't socialize um, without having access to high speed broadband. And so, you know, there are some conversations that are going on that, uh, that speak to the, the need for us to do this quickly to have ubiquitous, you know, high speed access across the country. And the surprising thing in the conversations that I've been having with people is it's not that much money to actually do it. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway, listen, um, this has been wonderful. I have a chance to chat with you and to see you. Um, we wanted to thank you so very much for making time today. Uh, we uh, thank you for the work that you do. Uh, you make a difference. And we're always proud to say that you are the MPP for, for Communitech. I um, wanted to also thank all of the people tuned in today for Tune Earth TV. Um, check back with us next Tuesday at noon for the next episode. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Laura May Lindo, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for watching this episode of True North TV. Subscribe to Communitech's YouTube channel to get notified of future episodes of True North TV.